Welcome, everyone. My name is Laurel Stavis, and on behalf of the Forum Planning Committee and the Office of the Provost, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth annual Student Forum on Global Learning. Today, you will hear from undergraduate and graduate students who truly reflect the movement towards freedom and dignity that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. worked for. Through internships, service, research, and study abroad, they have touched the world, and the world has touched them. I would like to especially thank the Dickey Center for International Understanding, as well as the Office of Diversity and Equity, the Tucker Foundation, the Rockefeller Center, undergraduate advising and research, off-campus programs, pluralism and leadership, the Rassius Center, the Dean of the College, and the Dartmouth American University of Kuwait program. And please join me in thanking President Carol Folt, our distinguished opening speaker, James Nachtwey, and departments and divisions across the college that have made this event possible. It is now my great privilege to introduce President Carol Folt, whose leadership is an inspiration to us all. A dedicated scholar and teacher, she is the recipient of the Huntington Prize for Excellence in Teaching and Research and holds the endowed position of the Dartmouth Professor of Biological Sciences. A renowned environmental scientist, President Folt has mentored more than 100 graduate and undergraduate students. Her research has led to new technologies and has influenced public policy for safer water. She serves on federal scientific review panels and foundation boards and has held elected office in international scientific societies. Please join me in welcoming President Folt. Thank you, Laurel. Laurel and I have had many wonderful global experiences, and I just want to thank Laurel uh, in particular. She's been very important in our relationships with Kosovo, and for me personally, they have been some of the more rewarding relationships I've had because they've allowed me to trace my own Albanian ethnicity back to a country of Albanians who have been facing incredible uh, social injustice. And Dartmouth students and Dartmouth relationships there through the medical school and through the Dickey Center and other areas have had an incredible impact, not only on the lives of those of us who have participated, but also on our friends and partners in Kosovo. So Laurel, you've been really important in that. So I thank you personally. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. On a day like this, where we celebrate the legacy of Do Dr. Martin Luther King, it's very fitting to begin by expressing gratitude. Of course, we express gratitude to Dr. King, whose magnificent legacy of impact and his gift of transformative language continues to inspire and challenge us. We also use this as a time to express gratitude to those in our own community who dedicate themselves every day to promoting civil rights, social justice, and respectful yet never faltering commitment and conversation about issues of the greatest importance to our community and the quality of lives as part of a caring, learning, and living community. As I look around the room, I see many of you here today. This morning, I also want to begin by thanking Amy Newcomb, Jill Savage, and the rest of the Global Learning Planning Committee because they put in an incredible amount of work to organize this great event, and also to Chris Wolferth for her dedication and oversight of the project. I think that this program, as you heard, the fourth Student Forum on Global Learning is a particularly meaningful, maybe a particularly meaningful Dartmouth way to begin a month-long set of reflections about what we're calling the art of nonconformity, making the world better. With this forum, we're focusing on student voices. These are the very voices of people who are going to help craft a stronger, more just future. For more than 50 years, indeed since President John Sloan Dickey and our own wonderful Professor John Rossius began Dartmouth's Learning Abroad programs, global learning has been considered to all of us a core of the Dartmouth education. 
And this year, by including student presenters from the Arts and Sciences, but also Geisel School of Medicine, Tuck School of Business, and the Dartmouth Institute's Masters of Public Health program really reflects the extent to which this commitment is institution-wide. As John Sloan Dickey said, true cross-cultural understanding comes through cross-cultural exchange. It's in the feeling and ex experience of these uh, exchanges our students experience global disparities in living conditions, in health, in justice, in education, and opportunity. These experiences, of course, highlight the privilege of a Dartmouth education, the privilege of a Dartmouth life, but the lasting impact, the knowledge of the responsibility that accompanies privilege is what I have always heard from our students when they return from these events. It makes me greatly admire the commitment to use your education and your opportunities to serve the better good. And I know that is what brings so many of you here today. These global experiences have enabled generations of Dartmouth students, as well as Dartmouth faculty, as well as Dartmouth staff, to have a real impact on the underserved communities of the world. And I've seen it time and time again. It begins as a student life and extends throughout their lives as professionals and as people in their own communities. So now I want to say what an incredible, extraordinary role model our students and our community has today in James Noctway, member of the class of 1970 and this year's inaugural Roth Distinguished Visiting Scholar. Just as Dr. King's words have had such an incredible, enduring power to change lives each time they're spoken with real truth and commitment, so do the thousands of images of civil conflict and social disparity that have been seen through the camera and the eyes of James Nakwe and shared with our world for decades. Jim, who I've come to know in the last couple of years and consider a friend, is to me the most impactful photojournalist of our time. He's publicly chronicled every major civil conflict around the world for more than 30 years. His life was deeply affected by the violence and po political upheaval that marked his own student years. And like so many of you, he determined then that he was going to dedicate his life to helping make change. He was particularly struck by powerful photos of civil rights movement and the Vietnam War, and these inspired him to use photography as his voice to the world and the voice of the people in the photographs to the world. And he continues to make a profound di difference. His work, of course, you know, has received major recognition, including the Dresden International Peace Prize, a TED Prize, the Heinz Foundation Prize, five Robert Kappa Global Medals. But everybody who knows Jim would know that the impact that matters most to him is the change these images can have on individuals' lives. In recent years, he's also turned his attention to major public health issues, including drug addiction, HIV AIDS, multi-drug resistance. When he was once asked what stops him from leaving places where he sees people who are forced to live in brutally inhumane conditions, Jim said, and I quote, I think if you go to places where people are experiencing these kinds of tragedies with a camera, you have a responsibility. The value of it is to make an appeal to the rest of the world, to create an impetus where change is possible through public opinion. Public opinion is created through awareness. My job is to create awareness. Jim, you have created awareness, and you use your art as a wonderful tool to impel social change like no other photographer has. We're so honored to have you with us here today to share your experience and to inspire our students and our community in their own lifelong quest for social action and involvement. Please join me in welcoming James Notway.
thanks for inviting me to join you today. My engagement with our world has been as a visual journalist and it's taken me on a journey through the past 32 years of contemporary history. It all began with a simple idea that photography can help change things. I came of age during the Vietnam War and the American Civil Rights Movement and press photography had a powerful impact. Our political and military leaders were telling us one thing and photographers were telling us another. I believe the photographers. Their pictures showed us what happens at ground level, behind the political rhetoric, and held decision makers accountable for the devastation of the war and for enforcing, often with violence, laws that were based purely on racism. Once our nation's collective consciousness evolved into a shared sense of conscience, change became not only possible, it became inevitable. Images not only recorded history, they helped change the course of history. Those are the ideas that motivated me to become a photographer and continue to keep me on the road to this day. In 1991, I published Deeds of War, and I want to show you some pages from that book. The first conflict I photographed was in Northern Ireland in 1981 during the time of the IRA hunger strike and weeks of violent demonstrations. I wanted to get right into the thick of the action and I roamed the streets every day looking for trouble. But I also wanted to show the effect of conflict on non-combatants caught in the middle. Contemporary wars are rarely fought on isolated battlefields, but right where people live and civilian casualties often outnumber casualties among the combatants. During the Cold War in the early 80s, Central America became a battleground for proxy wars with Marxist revolutionaries fighting regimes supported by the United States. In Nicaragua, U.S. financed counter-revolutionaries attacked a Sandinista outpost and during the assault, one of them was shot in the stomach and carried out of the jungle under fire. One minute he was courageously blasting away with his machine gun. The next minute he was begging his comrades to kill him. In El Salvador, a company of soldiers was ambushed. And when a young girl was wounded in the crossfire, her father tried to protect her with his own body. An anonymous act of heroism, a spontaneous reflex by an ordinary man in extreme danger, expressing the fundamental essence of fatherhood. The girl was airlifted to a nearby military base for treatment. She returned in a coffin and her father carried her to their village on his back. In Guatemala, a ruthless oligarchy of European descent waged a scorched earth campaign against an indigenous rebellion. And I saw an image that reflected the history of Latin America, conquest through a combination of the Bible and the sword. El Salvador, wounded soldiers were medevac from a village soccer field. The girls in their Sunday dresses looked like butterflies, and I couldn't help but acknowledge the paradox that something beautiful and delicate could coexist with the barbarity of war. In the Shuf Mountain War in Lebanon, these two soldiers were shell-shocked from days of intense bombardment. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, history moved into another era. Until then, I'd been concentrating almost exclusively on war. Now I began to document something besides all out conflict, where there was a social injustice that was being ignored but crying out to be corrected. The work culminated in the book Inferno, and I'll show you pages from the book. As the Soviet empire crumbled, parts of the world that had been off limits to the Western press opened up for the first time in decades, and I was curious to see the legacy of the communist regimes. There had been some wire service reports about an AIDS epidemic in Romania's orphanages, so I got on a plane and flew to Bucharest. I found a translator, hired a car, and drove around the country to investigate, using cigarettes and brandy to help persuade the authorities to give me access. You're about to see some disturbing images, and before you do, I want to say that I'm a witness, and my testimony has to be honest and uncensored. 
I want it to be powerful and eloquent, to do justice to the experience of the people I'm photographing. As difficult as it is for me to witness other people's tragedies, and as challenging as it might be for viewers to look at the images, it's nothing compared to the pain and fear the people in the pictures are actually living through. It's my obligation to be faithful to the facts, yet I always try to photograph with sympathy and compassion to break through political abstractions, ideology, and statistics so you can relate to what you're seeing deeply on a human level. What I discovered in Romania was a gulag of children. Thousands of orphans were being kept in medieval conditions. In order to expand the national workforce, Nicolae Ceausescu had decreed that families could not practice birth control or have legal abortions until they'd produced at least five children. Women's bodies were being used as instruments of state economic policy. Living conditions in Romania were so bad, families could not always support five children, so they committed them to the care of the state. There was little heat, few blankets or mattresses, bad food, virtually no medical care. When children became sick, instead of medication, they were injected with adult blood. A single syringe would be used for an entire orphanage, and sometimes the blood was infected with the AIDS virus. The worst conditions were reserved for children who were labeled incurables, those born with congenital handicaps. Once a child's record was stamped with that one word, they were condemned to a living hell, their only crime having been born in the first place. I never expected to see anything worse than what I witnessed in war, but nothing shook my faith in humanity more deeply than what I saw in Romania, and I came close to losing the courage to continue. But witnessing this social atrocity confirmed a new course, and for the next 10 years I documented crimes against humanity, often in relation to war. In Somalia, clan warfare had broken out, the central government ceased to exist, and starvation was being used as a weapon of mass destruction. Famine is probably the oldest and most primitive weapon of mass destruction known to man, and it's highly effective. Hundreds of thousands of people died. When I decided to go to Somalia, none of the magazines I'd worked closely with over the years were interested. For me, it's an article of faith that people will care if journalists give them something to care about. So I took off on my own without an assignment. I finally succeeded in getting the pictures published as a cover story in the New York Times Magazine. 17 years later, I had a chance meeting with the head of delegation for the International Red Cross who'd been in Mogadishu during the famine. He wanted to thank me for the effect my pictures had on the ICRC's ability to mobilize aid. I said surely he meant the photographs of the entire press corps, but he replied, no, I'm quoting, no, your pictures in the New York Times Magazine. The New York Times edition brought the immediate attention of the US government, followed by the UK, France, and the entire world. We enjoyed tremendous support. And we could proudly say that 1.5 million people survived thanks to what is and will remain the largest ICRC operation since World War II. James, your pictures made the difference, end of quote. What he told me validated my faith in journalism and in the power of images and made my entire career worthwhile. It also demonstrated that photography, no matter how strong it might be, is like howling in the wind unless it's activated by bold and committed editors. 1.5 million lives, that's the power of the press. Another consequence of the fall of the Soviet Union was the fracturing of Yugoslavia along ethnic fault lines. Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians became engaged in a post-national civil war. The battle for control of Mostar took place from house to house room to room, neighbor against neighbor. A bedroom, the place where people dream, where life itself is conceived, had become a battleground. When the factors that hold civilized society together break down, the fundamental instincts of territoriality, 
violence and basic survival take over. A father discovering that his son had died that day in battle. The response by the international community, especially Europe, was to let the conflict take its course, to do as little as possible to intervene. It was a policy that was morally bankrupt. As Serbian troops besieged Sarajevo, snipers shot children in cold blood, and the euphemism ethnic cleansing was invented to sanitize what amounted to genocide, military assault on civilian populations, murder, rape, kidnapping, torture, deportation. A park near Birchko had become a cemetery. The young Bosnian fighter who guided me told me that all his friends were now buried there. After the massacre of Srebrenica, where UN peacekeepers allowed Serbian troops to enter the city, NATO airstrikes were finally called in. They neutralized Serbian artillery positions and the war ended within a few weeks. When the Republic of Chechnya declared independence, the Russian army attacked and the capital city of Grozny was reduced to rubble with the civilian population trapped inside a Chechen fighter on the front line. A woman discovering that her neighbor has been killed by a mortar shell. This is an accomplishment of one of the most powerful armies in the world. As a journalist, I had to learn what to do with my anger. I had to use it, channel its energy, turn it into something that would clarify my vision instead of clouding it a funeral inside a private home. It's not possible to photograph private moments such as this unless the people actually want a photographer to be there. Most of the people I photograph are exploited, ignored, or victimized by the powers that be. They've been silenced and rendered invisible. When a photographer from the outside world shows up who's willing to share the same risks, who actually cares about what's happening to them, people open up they realize their grief will speak. In Rwanda, between half a million to a million people were slaughtered in the span of three months using farm implements as weapons. It was committed face to face, neighbor against neighbor, sometimes brother against brother. A man liberated from a Hutu death camp couldn't speak, so we communicated through eye contact and body language. He allowed me to photograph him and at one point even turned his face toward the light as if he understood what his scars would say to the rest of the world. Because people are suffering does not mean they don't express dignity. If people are afraid, it does not mean they lack courage. When people live in poverty, it doesn't mean they don't have hope. We often hear the phrase compassion fatigue. This man had nothing left except his will to live. As abused and terror-stricken as he was, he had not given up. And if he didn't give up, how could anyone in the outside world ever dream of losing hope? The Hutu army and militias fled into Zaire to escape the advancing Tutsi forces. In a single day, more than a million people crossed the frontier and set up camps on rocky volcanic earth where there was no clean water, and it was impossible to dig either latrines for sanitation or to bury the dead. Within days, a cholera epidemic swept through the camps. International relief agencies streamed into Goma and the surrounding area. Those responsible for the genocide concealed themselves within the mass of civilians inside the camps. Relief organizations were in a dilemma because they could not distinguish who was a killer from who was a human shield, they were obliged to treat everyone. Ironically, the international community that had walked away from its responsibilities during the genocide now came to the rescue of those who had committed the atrocities. The war in Yugoslavia was still not over. Serbian aggression was now aimed at Kosovo. This time, international action was more decisive and once NATO forces went in, the Serbian army withdrew almost immediately, but not before ethnic Albanians had been murdered, their farms destroyed, and a huge number of people forcibly deported. 
Kosovo was liberated at harvest time and in the midst of the ruins, farmers went back to work. The imprint of a man who'd been burned inside his own home. The image reminded me of a cave painting and echoed how primitive we still are. I've been covering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict since 1981. This is a moment from a demonstration in the West Bank town of Ramallah when it was still stones and Molotovs against an army. When political leaders don't find common ground, the continual friction of tactic and counter-tactic only perpetuates the cycle of violence. The uprising escalated into an armed conflict and during the hostilities, the Palestinian refugee camp in Jenin was destroyed. On September 11, 2001, history derailed. The collision punched a hole into a new era and America was again at war. Press images were visual testimony that the unthinkable had actually happened. I managed to survive and to work much as I had on other battlefields. The air was filled with smoke. Fighter jets flew overhead. Heavily armed soldiers patrolled the streets. To get back to my apartment, I walked for several miles and my neighborhood was deserted. There was no electricity, no hot water, no telephone, no place to buy food. I used candles for light. It was just like so many other war zones I'd worked in, only this time I was home. 9-11 represents a massive failure of foreign policy, of statesmanship and diplomacy, of intelligence and security, and of journalism. In the midst of the wreckage at Ground Zero, I had a realization. I've been photographing the Islamic world since 1981 in the Middle East, in Africa, Asia, and Europe. At the time I was photographing in these different places, I thought I was covering separate stories. But on 9-11, history crystallized. I understood it was all connected, that I'd actually been covering a single story for more than 20 years, and the attack on New York was part of it. These thoughts occurred to me as I prepared myself for the invasion of Afghanistan. I began working in Afghanistan during the Russian occupation, traveling in the mountains with the Mujahideen. In 1995, I went to Kabul to document the end of the Afghan civil war as it mutated into the war with the Taliban. This is the central commercial district just before the city fell. A woman mourns her brother who'd been killed by a Taliban rocket. In the orthopedic clinic founded by Alberto Cairo. Afghanistan turned the Cold War on its head. In the 80s, the Mujahideen, backed by the United States, were fighting what they perceived to be a Soviet occupation to support a puppet regime. Fast forward to 2001 the Taliban fighting what they consider an American occupation to support a puppet regime. This picture was made in 2010 in Helmand province. A Marine had both legs blown off by an IED, the signature weapon in both Iraq and Afghanistan. The flight medic stabilized the patient while the crew chief kept him from passing out so he could help fight for his own life. As attention shifted from Afghanistan to Iraq, I realized American troops would be well covered by the press. So I decided to document the invasion from inside Baghdad. The funeral of a guard who'd been on duty when his building was taken out by American bombing. A day after US forces entered Baghdad, a company of Marines began rounding up bank robbers and they were cheered on by the crowds. It was a hopeful moment but it didn't last. An Iraqi police officer showed up at one of the banks and began abusing the detainees right in front of the Marines. He then took several bags of cash from the bank, put them in his car and drove off. It seemed to be a preview of our new relationship with Iraq. For the first time in a generation, Shiites were allowed to make the pilgrimage to Karbala. Twelve years ago, I began to document global health issues in the developing world and saw that infectious diseases can be as devastating as war 
and affect far more people on an ongoing basis. Wherever I went, I encountered tuberculosis, a disease that thrives on the conditions of poverty. Because it's a disease of the poor, TB hasn't received the attention it deserves, even as it continues to mutate into deadlier strains. When a health issue gets on the radar screen of our collective consciousness, funding, research, and new initiatives happen much more quickly. And I decided to create a public awareness campaign about tuberculosis. Father Michael Bassano, an American priest, worked as a volunteer at an AIDS hospice in Thailand, where there was a high incidence of co-infection with tuberculosis. In a small TB ward in, in a remote part of Cambodia, in the poorest part of one of the poorest countries on the planet, among hardworking subsistence farmers, totally anonymous to the outside world, epic suffering was being endured. But also in that humble place existed love on an epic scale. Not one of the people I saw had given up hope. Those are the people who were silently crying out for help. Today we're honoring the life and work of Dr. King, and we're taking a moment to share with each other some of what we've learned from our experiences. For me, issues of journalism and photography are very important, but they're contained within a matrix of much larger meaning. The span of a career or of a lifetime is like the blink of an eye in the great scheme of things. But in that nanosecond of eternity, think how much we're given to learn. We witness injustice and cruelty, suffering, greed, envy, treachery, arrogance, betrayal. But we also learn the value of integrity, tolerance, respect, kindness, compassion, courage, friendship, humor, forgiveness, things that if we were lucky, our parents taught us and we spend the rest of our lives learning for ourselves, all in a heartbeat within the immensity of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nachwe, for an unforgettable, unforgettable series of images and experiences. Uh, and President Folt for a wonderful opening to this uh, fourth annual Student Forum on Global Learning. Please join us now, everyone, upstairs, as we hear our student presentations. I'd like to remind you that there are concurrent sessions taking place. They start at noon and the other Concurrent group starts at 2 p.m. Lunch will be available at all of the sessions, so please stay with us as long as you can. You will hear stories of courage. You will hear stories of persistence and engagement, stories that have changed our students' lives. And if you let them, they will surely change yours. Thank you so much.